so You're listening to a Mamma Mia podcast. Mamma Mia acknowledges the traditional owners of land and waters that this podcast is recorded on. It's June 20, 2001, and 911 operator Doreen Stubblefield is diligently taking calls in Houston Police Department's dispatch office. At 9.48 a.m., a call comes through from 942 Beachcomber Lane. What's your name? Um, I just needed to come. Is your home the woman sounds calm and gives no indication of why assistance is needed. I need to know why we're coming, ma'am. They are standing next to you. Are you having the service? Are you ill or what? Uh, yes, I'm ill. You need an ambulance? No, I need a police officer. I'm sitting in line. When police arrive at the home, they're confronted by a scene that will send shockwaves across America. Overnight, Andrea Yates will become a household name, a haunting example of the fatality of untreated postpartum psychosis. What were you trying to accomplish then when you did take your children's lives? Maybe in their, their innocent years, God would take them up. God would take them up to be in heaven, is that what you mean? All right. And if you had not taken their lives, what do you think would happen to them? So we would continue stumbling. And where would they end up? Hell. In hell. This is True Crime Conversations, a Mamma Mia podcast exploring the world's most notorious crimes by speaking to the people who know the most about them. I'm Rebecca Davis, Mamma Mia's Senior News and Features Writer, filling in for Gemma Bath. Today's episode is about Andrea Yates, but before we discuss her case, I do want to let you know that this episode deals with severe mental health issues, as well as child death. If those things are triggering or upsetting to you, we understand if you want to give this one a miss. In 2001, Andrea was responsible for the drowning deaths of her five children, seven-year-old Noah, five-year-old John, three-year-old Paul, two-year-old Luke, and six-month-old Mary. Joining me to help us understand this crime is forensic psychiatrist Dr. Shaham Das. Before we jump in, Shaham, can you give us a bit of background on your expertise? Yeah, absolutely. So I am a consultant forensic psychiatrist based in London. So a psychiatrist is a medical doctor who treats people who have mental illnesses. And a forensic psychiatrist does that with people who've committed serious offences, anything from arson to sexual assaults to attempted murder to murder. So that's what I do. I assess and rehabilitate people who have severe mental illnesses, who uh, have committed severe crimes. And what have you learned during your work in this space about humankind and how much control we do or don't have over our own minds? That's a good question. I would say that it's very variable. So with the clients that I see, I also should mention that I work as an expert witness, so I give evidence in criminal trials. In the clients that I see, there's a huge spectrum. I would summarise it by saying on one end of the spectrum, you have people with mental illnesses. So a very typical example would be schizophrenia, people who are hearing voices or they have paranoid delusions and those things make them potentially violent. Just to really make the point, that's of the patients that I see, not all people with schizophrenia. I assess people you know, from prison. So those people I've learnt often have issues with being able to control their behaviour. So they have external forces that really impact their beliefs and their experiences. And on the other end of the spectrum, you have people with personality disorders. So often the two get confused, but a mental illness is when you step out of reality. So as I said before, hearing voices, paranoid delusions, whereas a personality disorder is much more ingrained. It's part of you. Now, tell me about Andrea Yates and the life she and her family had created for themselves in Houston, Texas. They had a very religious life, didn't they? They did, yeah. So Andrea Yates, she had a mental illness, so she was in and out of hospital Mm. throughout her entire adult life. She had what we call postpartum psychosis or pupural psychosis, which means that 
every time she had a child, she became extremely psychotic for short periods of time, for months at a time. And then more or less would get better after a few months. So she was in and out of hospital. She had a very chaotic kind of upbringing. And as you say yourself, her and her husband were very religious. What I think is quite interesting is I believe they weren't really members of a recognized church. They had this very weird preacher Pentecostal, I believe is the word. Mm. They would see on a regular basis and hold Bible groups, even though they didn't connect to a regular mainstream church. But this person apparently would preach fire and brimstone and the devil. And a lot of that actually got absorbed into Andrew Yates' delusions. When you say absorbed, what do you mean by that? So I think that when you have somebody that's very vulnerable and can't differentiate reality from fantasy, then when you have all of this damnation and all of these quite scary and terrifying comments that are made, you can absorb that. If you're psychotic, you can absorb that into your thoughts. So I don't think that the preacher caused her to be psychotic, but I think she was already psychotic and she absorbed a lot of what he was saying. So. What exactly happened on the morning of June 20, 2001? So it was absolutely horrific. To put it into context, so she had a six-month-old baby and she had become psychotic, so obviously six months before that morning, and was in and out of hospital for a very short period of time, I think too short a period of time. And Andrea was suffering from a number of psychotic symptoms. So she genuinely believed that her children had been marked by the devil and that she had to end their lives to prevent them going to hell. And she also believed that the devil was returning to earth because she'd heard a voice of the devil speaking. And again, she could only prevent that by ending the lives of the children. She also had what we call delusions of reference. So that's when an individual who's psychotic believes that there are messages specifically for them. So Andrea believed that the cartoon characters were speaking to her and telling her that she had to kill her children. And apparently she'd been considering it for two years. So for two years, she had been thinking about killing her children and then eventually just sort of snapped one morning. So she systematically drowned all of her children at breakfast. Mm. You know, there was no agitation. She wasn't, you know, violent with them or angry at them. It was just very kind of matter-of-factly, very systematically. She did it in one at a time. And the thing that really sends shivers down my spine is that the children were six months, two, three, five, and seven. And apparently the seven-year-old cottoned on to what was happening. He tried to run and Andrea sort of chased him and... And killed him. Mm-hmm. And then the other thing is that Andrea immediately phoned her husband and she phoned the police, which to me is, is very telling because that's somebody who I think would have a defense of not guilty by reason of insanity. That's not somebody who, you know, did something in a fit of rage and is trying to cover it up. It's the opposite. She fully admitted her actions. In the calls that she made that morning to her husband and to the police, what was her demeanor like at that time? And do we know what she actually said to them? Apparently, she was very calm and um, collected. So she wasn't in any way agitated. She wasn't particularly remorseful. And she just told them what she'd done. She said that she drowned her children and that she had to do it because of the devil. When police arrived on the scene, they didn't know exactly what they'd find due to the vagueness of Andrea's 911 call that you heard at the start of the episode. Here's Officer Frank Stumpo describing that moment for an interview on the crimes that changed us. I got there, and another unit is already on the other side of the street. As I entered the house, Andrew Yates was sitting on the couch, and I asked Officer Knapp, I said, what is it? What's going on? That's when he told me it's a homicide. She showed no emotion, no fear, nothing. I figured she killed her husband or boyfriend, and I walked down this long corridor, and I was expecting to see a body, a man's body. When I walked into the room, there was no body there, but I saw a little head and I thought it was a doll. And as I got close to it, you know, the closer I got, the more I realized, wow, you know, this this is a child. And I touched his forehead, it was ice cold. And I picked up the blanket where the child was, and more children started to materialize. And they were all lined up all side by side. There were four of them in that bed. To this day, my mind's eye can recreate the image that I saw. I put the blanket back on top of the children. I turned into the bathroom and I found the oldest one. Shaham, after the murders, despite a history of diagnoses, 
Andrea claimed she wasn't mentally ill. Why do you think that was? I think people who have these kind of psychotic symptoms tend to lack insight. So it's very common for them to fully be invested in and believe their experiences. Mm. So when they hear the voice of the devil, they actually think the devil's talking to them. They don't understand that it is in the context of mental illness. Yeah. You've mentioned Andrea having postpartum psychosis. And for many people, that might be a new term. They've likely heard of postpartum depression. But just to clarify, what's the difference between those two things? Is it black and white or more of a spectrum? I suppose it's relatively black and white, relatively easy to differentiate. So postpartum depression is exactly what it sounds like. So it's when mothers go through something that's more severe than the baby blues. There is a low mood, lack of energy, problems sleeping, low appetite. But generally speaking, there's, there is a minimal risk of suicide, but there's very little risk to the actual baby itself. Whereas postpartum psychosis, which is rarer than the depression, is much more intense. So it's exactly the things we've been talking about, you know, delusions, hallucinations, beliefs that the baby is in some way marked or in some way inferior. And there's a huge risk with the mother committing some violence towards the baby. So postpartum psychosis is rarer, but much more potentially dangerous. Are there any additional factors that make someone more higher risk of experiencing postpartum psychosis? Just a background history of psychosis. So Mm. people like Andrea who have schizophrenia, who have a regular psychosis are more at risk. Also a family history. So people that have psychosis, schizophrenia in their family are more likely to have postpartum psychosis. How regularly do you see this in your work? How common is it? It's very rare. So it happens to around one in a thousand mothers. Mm. I think I've seen postpartum psychosis, I'm trying to think, maybe two or three times in my career. And to put that into perspective, how many cases would you see in a year? So I'd say I see somewhere between 150 to 200 cases a year. Yeah, so around three. or Actually, probably less than that, probably about 150, I'd say. Yeah, so about three a week I I see. Uh, Only a very small proportion of them are murder and only a very small proportion of them have severe mental illness enough that that would detract from the criminal responsibility. I've read that after her fourth child, Andrea was actually advised by one of her doctors not to have any more children. Is that something that's commonly advised to women who experience this? No, I would say in the UK, I can't really speak for America, but I think ethically there's it's a bit of a, a grey area to be advising them mm. whether they can have children or not. So I think what we would do in the UK instead is if you had somebody who was high risk, they would be looked after from a few weeks before they're about to give birth. So we have these mother and baby units that are like psychiatric units that are built for being able to look after young babies. So there's all the equipment, you know, nappies, changing tables, etc. And as a specialty, childbirth and mental illness is expanding. So I don't think in the UK we'd discourage women to have children, but what we would do is encourage them strongly to come in a couple of weeks before and then look after them with a high level of supervision and observation straight after childbirth. That wasn't the only medical advice or help she was given, though. She was medicated for her psychosis, wasn't she? She was, but apparently I read that Well, a couple of things. First of all, this is quite a few years before the killings. She was discharged from hospital prematurely because the insurance companies didn't want to pay for her staying in hospital, which is absolutely shocking. That would never happen in the UK. So that's one thing that I think is absolutely shocking. And another thing is apparently months before the killings, her psychiatrist tried to take her off antipsychotic medication even Mm. though she's still suffering symptoms, which is absolutely insane to me. You know, so apparently she was mute. She was pulling out her own hair. She was neglecting her baby. So this is all in a few months leading up to the killings. And then she was sectioned to a hospital and she was discharged early and the psychiatrist encouraged her to stop her medication, which is completely wrong. You know, we should be keeping people who are that high risk and who are that ill on medication indefinitely. She's my patient. I'd have her on meds for minimum six months or a year after that situation, I certainly wouldn't be Mm. encouraging that. And being taken off those medications so abruptly, from a physiological point of view, what actually happens to the brain? Sure. So we know that antipsychotics block dopamine receptors. That's how they work. And over 
activity of dopamine in certain parts of the brain is related to psychosis and schizophrenia. So I'd be the first to admit as a psychiatrist that we use quite blunt tools. Antipsychotics are quite blunt. So what I mean by that is they block lots of different receptors and they have lots of different side effects. And so it's very important when you're making changes to do it very slowly. So if you have somebody on antipsychotics for weeks or even months and then you suddenly decrease the dose, similar to antidepressants really, there's a risk of rebound psychosis. So it has to be done very, very slowly. You know, we're talking maybe five, 10% of the dose to be decreased every week or every couple of weeks. And not doing that has massively increased the risks of psychosis. And then you also have the added impact of the fact that her father passed away after her daughter's birth, her fifth child. I'm yeah. assuming that factor as well would have exacerbated her condition yeah absolutely so people with psychotic illnesses or depressive illnesses often relapse or their symptoms can can intensify when they have trauma yeah obviously this happened in the early 2000s when people's understanding of mental illness just wasn't what it is today but even still hearing about how she was in and out of hospital and on and off medication do you think that the psychiatrists and doctors that treated her have something to answer for then? Absolutely, yeah. I think that there is blood on their hands, not just the psychiatrists, but also the insurance companies that wouldn't pay for her to remain in hospital. I don't understand how this happens, how there's so many layers here where she's seemingly fallen through the cracks that has had the ultimate ramification. Yeah, absolutely. You're listening to True Crime Conversations with me, Rebecca Davis. I'm speaking with forensic psychiatrist Dr. Shaham Das about Andrea Yates. Andrea went through two very public trials for this crime. What was the media and the public reaction when news of this case broke? So there was absolute consternation and shock, as you would expect. I think very few people had any sympathy for Andrea Yates because, you know, she killed her children, including a six-month-old baby. And actually, I think that's relevant because, so Andrea Yates actually initially had a prison sentence. So she was sentenced to um, life imprisonment for murder Mm. by children. And I absolutely staunchly believe that that was the wrong decision. And apparently that was because of the psychiatric evidence of an expert witness, one of my brethren, consultant forensic psychiatrist called Dr. Dietz, who was working for the prosecution. And he said a couple of things that were clinically unsound and just simply not true. So he said that because, so there's a very specific psychiatric defense called not guilty by reason of insanity. And to summarize the defense, you have to have a lack of reasoning. So not be able to make a logical decision Mm -hmm. with a recognized medical condition. So it has, there has to be a diagnosis. It can't just be in the context of anger or jealousy. It has to be something like schizophrenia, postpartum psychosis. So that either the person didn't know the, the nature and the quality of the act. So I think Andrea did know that she was killing her children, so that wouldn't be relevant. Or they didn't know that it was wrong. And I would argue that she didn't know what she was doing was wrong because she, in her deluded mind, she genuinely believed that she had to end her children's life. She believed that she was saving them. So I believe that she should have met that psychiatric defence. So this is a roundabout way of me saying, I think that the public reaction had a lot to do with that. I think because the public were baying for blood, that was part of the reason that the judge, as well as this incorrect evidence, that was part of the reason that the judge made that finding of guilty of murder. So Dr. Dietz said that because Andrea heard the voice of the devil, as opposed to the voice of God, she would have known what she was doing was wrong, which to me is just completely illogical. It doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. You know, somebody's psychotic. You could have two people that are very similar. One of them hears the voice of God and ends up going to psychiatric hospital for rehabilitation. And one of them has very similar symptoms, but hears the voice of the devil and gets sent down for murder. It was very, very bizarre. And he said some other things that weren't true. So he was a consultant for Law & Order SVU. Yes, And he said that there was an episode that had been released where a woman had killed her child and had faked mental illness to end up going to hospital. So he was heavily insinuating that Andrea Yates saw this episode and did exactly that. Whereas actually in reality, even though he had been a consultant for that episode, it wasn't released many months later, way after the trial when she was in prison for murder. So her trial was in 2002, and then she was retried in 2006, I believe. And the correct outcome, which is not guilty by reason of insanity, then moved to a psychiatric hospital for long-term rehabilitation, was decided rather than a life sentence in prison. 
So to your knowledge, from the time of that initial call to the police, to her husband, all the way through the trials, did she show any remorse at all? Um, No. And I think that's because she was psychotic. So in her mind, she was fully 100% invested in her beliefs. Like she thought she did the right thing. Mm. And in fact, I believe that she herself initially resisted her solicitors trying to get the insanity plea because she thought, well, that doesn't make sense. You know, I killed them for the right reason. So I'm not insane in her mind. So she, Mm. she was quite resistive and I believe it is only years later after a a long-term treatment that she actually questioned her beliefs. Something else I think is quite interesting is that she's still in hospital now and every year she has an opportunity to plead her case to be released from a secure psychiatric hospital and every year she goes down so she doesn't want to leave. So I do wonder whether that is because she's still got some symptoms to a degree or whether it's you know just guilt. From a medical standpoint, after such serious psychosis and depression, what's the probability of her ever being able to live a normal life? So that's quite a complicated one because mm. it's, it's very, very variable. Psychosis generally does get treated in the majority of cases, not in all cases. And sometimes, especially if it's very severe, it can take weeks or months of antipsychotic treatment to improve. So I think given that she's been in a psychiatric hospital since 2006, I believe. So what we're talking, you know, over 15 years, I think it's very likely that she can have had the treatment or she has had the treatment that has uh, got rid of her most of her symptoms. So as long as she continues taking her medication and doesn't have any other children, or if she does have other children, then she's got a high level of support. As long as that happens, then I think in theory, there's no reason that she couldn't go on to live independently in the community. You know, she still needs a high level of supervision and she still needs to see a psychiatrist on a regular basis. Mm. Having said that, there's an argument that because what she did was so risky that she shouldn't be released just, you know, purely on on that basis. You mentioned that she's obviously still in a hospital. Do we know anything about her quality of life now? Not really, no, to be honest. Mm. I know that she stepped down in levels of security. So I know that she was in quite a high level of security initially. And over time, she's gone to a medium and then like a low level of security. Obviously, I've never seen them in the States, but having worked on many of those units in London and in the UK, I can say that the lower levels of security patients have a relative amount of freedom. So they might have escorted or unescorted leave. So if it's escorted, they'll be followed with a nurse into the local you know, community shops. They generally have activities, whether that could be anything from going to the gym, to knitting, to dog walking. They usually find things for the patients to do. Yeah. Mm. I assume that would be a level of quality of life. At the end of the day, she murdered five children. How do we differentiate that from her mental state? I think it puts a lot of people in a in an uncomfortable position to think about this. While they might on one level understand that she has a mental disorder, but on the other hand, she was still responsible for murdering five children. How do we reckon that? You know, from a moral point of view, and how do we understand that really to differentiate between the crime that she's committed and the mental state? Sure. So I suppose that is quite a philosophical question, really, because it kind of depends on individuals and what they think about it. I personally, in my line of work and from what I've seen morally, if there is somebody like the case of Andrew Yates, and I've seen people in similar situations, as I mentioned before, if I believe that they were fully not in control of their actions and if in their minds what they did was justifiable. And, you know, you can explore that not just as a one-off assessment, but by speaking to them over many months or even years in therapy, then I personally would, I don't know if forgive's the right word, I would, I'm not sure what the right word is really, I personally would accept that they weren't criminally responsible. Having said that, I think a lot of people would disagree. So a lot of people would say that regardless of whether she's in control of her actions, her crime was so heinous that she, you know, deserves punishment and horrible things happening to her. So I'm I'm not really giving you an answer because it kind of depends on your perspective. But I personally would fully accept that what she did, she did in the state of psychosis and she didn't know what she was doing. That's Mm. what I believe. And that's the stance that her husband also took on the situation. They're no longer married, but at the time he seemed to be very understanding. The woman here is not the woman that killed my children. She obviously wasn't herself. And I think that'll come out, you know. I'm I'm, just completely surprised that people think that, well, because I defend Andrea as being a a wonderful mother, that she shouldn't be punished, that somehow, 
you know, uh, I'm condoning her actions, you know. Knowing how much Andrea loved our children and how much they loved her, and knowing that she would never have harmed them had she not been mentally ill, all right? I, I view her, and I know it's hard for people to, to see this, but I view her as a victim. That was him on an episode of Crimes of the Century. Now, Dr. Shaham, if you were to rewind the clock, say she was one of your patients, what should have been done differently? I think that she should have had a much more intense degree of treatment. So she became psychotic after the birth, well, after every single one of her children, but Mm. most recently after the birth of her six-month-old. And she was only in hospital for a very short period of time. So I think she should have been kept in hospital for much, much longer. So apparently even when she left hospital, she still had some symptoms. She was quite openly saying that she was hearing voices. So I don't think she should have been discharged. I think she should have been in hospital for the weeks, if not months, longer. Her medication should have been continued indefinitely until she started having some kind of resolution of the psychotic symptoms. Mm. I appreciate that you can probably only speak from the point of view of, of being in the UK, but do you think that generally there's a good understanding between the law and mental health conditions in terms of the sentencing around that? No, not at all. Not at all. <laughs> Which is good for me because, you know, it gives me <laughs> work as an expert psychiatrist, but I think the general public have lots of misconceptions. So, you know, off the top of my head, people think that you can fake the not guilty by reason sanity and that's easy to do, but it's not. And even I have to say, you know, I don't want to sound too critical, but even professionals struggle with it. So I work with barristers and solicitors and they often misunderstand things. I think there's a reason for that. It's because something like not guilty by reason sanity is very rare for somebody to reach the threshold. You know, I'm probably asked to assess it maybe 20 times a year and only get that finding of that psychiatric defense once or twice a year because of the threshold so high. So people don't really understand the ins and outs of the medical legal criteria from my experience. So yeah, lots of misunderstanding. What's the best way, do you think, as a society that we can speak to that understanding and actually put the structures in place? I mean, I think people are generally quite interested in everything that we're talking about. So they're interested in extreme violence, they're interested in mental illness. So I suppose it's just education. You know, I've got my YouTube channel, for example, I talk about these kinds of defenses. So putting it out there and letting people understand what the technical criteria is, I suppose you have to balance it because you don't want to get too in-depth or too technical because people find that boring. But at the same time, you want to educate the public about the system that's in place to help people like Andrea who have severe mental illnesses. It can be quite dangerous. To that end, what can we learn from this case in particular and what's your main takeaway after researching this? There's a couple of things that really strike me about this case. Obviously, the nature of what she did is tragic, you know, mm. extreme. I, I said before that I've occasionally seen people that have killed their own children who are in a state of psychosis. So I've only seen that maybe two or three times in my entire career over 15 years. So it's very, very rare. But to kill five children is almost unheard of you know it's an exceptionally tragic case that's the first thing that really stands out and the other thing that stands out to me about this case is the false testimony by dr dietz you know it's shocking to me that she ended up going to prison for four years and i do wonder whether that is related to the public reaction because what she did was so heinous that people didn't care or didn't accept that she can get any kind of uh, mitigation from her mental illness Mm. Uh, you know, it's it's like we were saying before, I accept what she did was horrific, but I also believe fully that she didn't know what she was doing. So she should have gone mm. after defence, in my view, straight away at the first time around for the first trial. Yeah. You mentioned there that in your 15-year career, you've seen about two or three other cases. Are you able to comparatively discuss anything from those other cases? Uh, yeah. So I, I think two cases, one where a mother smothered and killed her I think it was a three-month-old baby mm. and another another case where a very young 80-year-old woman also smothered and killed her three-year-old nephew. And the one thing that really strikes me is that their symptomatology was very, very similar. So all three, Yandri Yates and these two patients that I'm talking about, all three of them had delusional beliefs about demons or the devil. All three believed that the child was somehow marked and that they were hearing voices and they had to do this. They felt compelled to do this to save the child's lives or to save their own lives. So I suppose comparatively, 
the system i think in the uk is a bit quicker so with andrea yates her trial was a year after the killings and then the appeal was four years after that whereas in the cases that i've seen both cases were heard within a couple of months of the actual offense and in the cases that i saw so i actually gave evidence in both of them the transfer to hospital was much quicker as well so you know we're not talking about several years we're talking about a few months just finally in your profession and you know, you mentioned that you've been doing it now for quite some time. How do you look after yourself when you're dealing with such pretty horrendous circumstances? Uh, that's a good question, Rebecca. So I think one thing that helps is I'm very, very clear in my head what my role is mm. before I start seeing a, a client, a patient. To give you a specific example, when I assess the woman who ended up killing her own child, I know what my role is. So my role is, do they have a mental illness? Yes or no? If so, did she have specific symptoms that she was suffering at the time of the killing? Yes or no. Crucially, did those symptoms decrease her criminal culpability? And if the answer to all of those things is yes, then she should end up going to a psychiatric hospital. If any of them is no, then she should end up going down the criminal justice route. So I suppose the point I'm trying to make is that in my head, I'm only there to look after their mental health. And I trust in the court system that people who do bad things get punished, you know, so I trust that the system works. So that's one thing. And then to be honest with you, the other things that I'm really, really busy. So I have a constant stream of cases. So as soon as I've finished seeing one case, no matter how horrific it might be, I've already got two or three others lined up to see. And I do lots of things outside of my work, you know, from the media to going to the gym, to spending time with my wife and kids. So I'm too busy to really, you know, perseverate or mm. find myself occupied with cases that I've seen. Mm. And as a father yourself, does it make it harder for these specific cases? Yeah, yeah. For cases where people have hurt children or sexually abused children, which I see occasionally, I think it has made a difference, actually, to my surprise. Mm. Uh, I thought I was quite hardened. I didn't think that having, having kids would change that. But I think it does. It gives you an, an extra level of empathy, really. Thanks to Dr. Shahom for helping us tell this story. If you'd like to hear more of his analysis of criminal cases, he regularly releases videos to his YouTube channel, A Psych for Soul Minds, which you'll find linked in our show notes. Thanks for listening to this episode of True Crime Conversations, which was produced by Gia Moylan with audio design by Rhiannon Mooney. 